All right, it's uh, my great pleasure um, uh, to introduce our speaker today. Um, it was, um, first as a, as a way of background, it was our own Dr. Target, um, who's a bit of an expert on the production uh, of Scotch whiskey. And uh, in his academic pursuit of the topic, uh, ran into our speaker uh, today, who has a, has a shared interest. And that is Dr. Michael Griffo, who's visiting us from Griffo Distillery, a venture he started with his wife, Jenny. His physics background includes a bachelor's from UC Berkeley, a PhD from UC Santa Cruz, where he continued with a postdoctoral fellowship. He has studied condensed matter physics, nanoparticle organic structures, and photoluminescence of polymer thin films. He definitely has his physics cred, as we say. He left academia and became an algorithmic trading manager at Barclays, uh, modernizing uh, the market with electronic trading. Uh, this is a, a career for physicists um, going to Wall Street that's often called being a quant, um, which, which uh, Dr. Griffo will talk about today. Um, at the Griffo Distillery page, he discusses how he and his wife uh, sat down in 2008 to um, chart out the kind of life that they wanted. Um, and now that, that led to the distillery, which in the later part of his talk, I'm sure he'll discuss. Uh, I think this is a fascinating career path and what should be a, a fascinating talk about physics careers. Let's welcome Dr. Michael Griffo. Thank you, Scott. Um, it's a pleasure to be invited to, to speak today. And uh, I hope I can give you guys a little bit of something to think about when you walk away, or at least um, a cautionary tale of something not to follow. Um, so yeah, I, you know, uh, I think that uh, earlier I was talking to Scott, and Scott said something about how um, um, it's interesting how, as a physicist inside a university, you're being mentored by a bunch of academics, um, and it's. And it's difficult to necessarily, not necessarily extremely difficult, but it can be difficult to probe outside in the industry to figure out what are possible career paths and what it's actually like to go there um, and do that. And so I figured that I would gear towards uh, today's talk towards uh, the undergraduate audience and give you sort of a first person perspective on you know, a few different careers that I've gone through. Um, and, uh, and hopefully it'll be insightful. So, um, I just have to comment that my background image here, I sort of cracked up that when I picked it because I was looking for something that would fit, you know, Wall Street and, and science and physics and and uh, nothing really fits that. So this is what came up on the image search when I searched quantum. And I don't think it means anything. <laughs> I mean, maybe particle physics with some like radiation from accelerated charge, but there's nothing kind of coming off tangentially, so I don't know. It's, it's fun anyway. So the outline for today's talk is um, my, my, my career, and, uh, which is kind of funny. And at the end of this talk, um, I will go more into distilling because that's what I'm doing now, and I think it's a lot of fun. Um, but I'll briefly cover so my undergraduate and graduate, and then what I did as a postdoc. Um, and then I briefly went into patent law, and then uh, did uh, work on Wall Street for a few years, and then moved back to California. And so then I'll talk about the physics that governs distillation, and then what I and how I use physics in the distillery um, currently. So as an undergraduate, when I went into uh, Berkeley, I didn't know uh, that I was going to be a physicist. I thought I was going to do uh, marine biology because that was the best class that I took uh, at high school. And there was one course that I took in marine biology that was called oceanography. And in that course, the professor stopped the class one day and said, okay, so today's going to be a little bit harder and I'm going to walk you through it slowly, but everyone just be patient because we're going to talk about some physics. And I didn't have any physics at, in high school, and so, um, and I had a rough idea of what it was, but I was like, oh, okay, well, let's see what this is. And it was the best day of whatever, like, four courses of freshman sort of um, 
uh, marine biology that I was taking. And we did that a few times that semester. And by the end of the last class, I thought, I should go take a physics class. Because, you know, we're, we're talking about Coriolis effects and echoing spiral and transport and talking about pressure gradients and temperature gradients and a little bit of um, atmospheric science. And, you know, it was just sort of wrapping a bunch of that stuff into one. And I thought, wow, physics governs all of this. And this is, this is incredible. Uh, and so I went and took more math and more physics and more math and more physics until finally I, I came out the other end of physics. So go figure. But uh, as an undergrad, um, I was pretty motivated, and I uh, ended up getting a, a, a position with a couple of professors working at Stanford, um, at SLAC, the Stanford Linear Accelerator Center, working on an experiment called E158. And uh, that was my first introduction to computer programming. I was forced to learn Fortran 77. And uh, I think that there's been a big movement to try to convert a lot of that Fortran code over to C++. Um, but it's, it's um, a momentous effort. So um, I'm, I'm sure that 90% of it's still running on Fortran. Um, but it's, uh, you know, it, it, I've seen that over and over again in my career. And it's, you know, it's not anyone's fault. It's just it, what works. And you need to keep moving forward. So, uh, in that experiment, uh, I think there was like 600 PhDs working on it. We were measuring some off-resonance boson. Um, and uh, my job was to look at um, the spin precession of electrons coming down the beam line. Uh, when you have a charge or spin moving through a magnetic field, um, the, uh, the spin precesses around the, uh, the radial lines of the magnetic field and uh, or the flux lines. And you know when we were using a polarized beam and uh, inside of a, a linear accelerator tunnel, there's all sorts of uh, quadrupole magnets and uh, and uh, dipole and whatnot. And so you're you're changing the shape of the beam and you're accelerating it and uh, and you're also compressing the spins of your your packets of electrons that are going down the line. <coughs> 0.991c. And so my job was to figure out what the orientation of spins were and what the distribution was um, by the time it hit its target at the end of the, of the accelerator. Uh, I did that for a year or so, and uh, at some point in time, I decided to move away from particle physics. And the reasoning there was because um, the, the physics is extremely sexy, um, and uh, I was definitely in love of, with that, but I was also overwhelmed by the fact that there were you know, a thousand people working on this one experiment that was dreamed up 10 or 20 years before I got there. And by the time I got there, you know, I had this one small little part, and for a lot of um, you know, my friends that did particle physics, you, know, you do your whole PhD on this one experiment, and it started before you got your PhD, and it continues after you finish your PhD. And you can write some papers with, you know, I don't know how many gross uh, PhDs also on that, on that title. But, you know, you have, you have your small part, and you do it, and, you, and there's interesting stuff. I wouldn't turn anyone away from particle physics, because the physics is incredible, and um, the problems that you solve are very good. And, um, if you're a, a great physicist, you can achieve great things. Um, but I wanted to be a lot more sort of hands-on and um, see projects through from beginning to end. And at the same time, there was a professor uh, at Berkeley who was doing, taking the same measurement that Slack was measuring, um, but inside of his lab. And that just blew me away. There's, you know, a thousand you know, people working on this experiment using the same amount of energy it took to run a small city to measure something. And here was a guy with, you know, a postdoc and another student inside their lab on an optical table measuring the exact same thing, just with, you know, some lasers and going into the machine shop, you know, once a month or whatever, machining a new part for their stuff. 
and uh, and I was blown away. So I went to him and I I said I want to I want to do research with you. I want to I want to learn how you do what you do and and uh, and have fun doing it. And he said no. <laughs> um, but I wasn't deterred. I uh, then knocked on every other door of every other this matter business in Berkeley, and I finally found one that said yes. And uh, and that's not to say that he was uh, you know uh, inferior or second choice really, because once you come down to it, there's just incredible research that people are doing all over the place. Another person was setting up quantum corrals taking a scanning tunneling microscope and moving atoms into formations where you would modify the, um, the, the wave function by creating these quantum boundary conditions so that you'd modify the, the quantum wave function inside this crowd. And you could place atoms within it and see ghosts and mirror images of it in other locations. And just super exciting for this. And I ended up working with Alex Zettel, who's looking at uh, the energy density of carbon nanotubes um, and individual nanoparticles and things smaller than 50 nanometers in diameter and looking at you know the energy structure within atoms themselves and uh, and how that's modified when they come close to other atoms um, and like this, <coughs> this picture here is of a carbon nanotube with some uh, absorbance on it where they modify the electronic structure in that molecule and um, just you know probing quantum mechanics and that is beautiful and it's fun uh, and in that process you know you're working with materials you're you're reading uh, theory you're reading experimental papers you're thinking about where physics is today and you're thinking about what questions haven't been answered yet and then you dream up experiments on how to how to answer those questions and then you actually go into the lab and you start building and you build these experiments and then you run the experiments and then you finish the experiment hopefully and and then you write a paper and it gets published and you're excited and people are excited and you move on and it's a great thing and for me it was really um, you know it, it was something that I love to do because it's a little bit more project based and it uh, and I could see through things from beginning to end. And I really enjoyed that. Um, and in that process, um, it, that was my first exposure to the stone, because you're working with these really small um, molecules uh, or atoms, and you don't want um, large distributions of them. And so you need to separate them out in order to choose exactly the right kind of, of molecule that you want to be able to, um, to study the structure of. And so, um, yeah, sort of a foreshadowing of my current career. So I went to uh, graduate school at UC Santa Cruz. Um, I was sort of a, I've always sort of followed my passion, and, um, and sometimes I make good career choices and sometimes I make bad ones. And this one was, uh, I decided I loved physics and I wasn't done learning yet, and so I wanted to go to grad school. But I also wanted to go to grad school where there was good surf. <laughs> and so I applied to uh, San Diego, UCLA, like UCSD, uh, UCLA, and Santa Cruz, and um, got into all of them. And I went to visit each one, and uh, because I had such good research experience as an undergrad, I knew that when you go to grad school, you don't, you don't necessarily choose the school, but you choose who you want to work with. And so I spoke with professors um, and talked to them about uh, what I would do if I was able to get into their group and what kind of research they're conducting. And, um, and I ended up finding someone that um, I really wanted to work for at Santa Cruz. Um, and that was uh, Professor Sue Carter. And she studied the interaction between light and matter. And I thought that was really exciting. So I went to work for her. And uh, I did a number of sort of research uh, uh, projects there. Most of them involved nanoparticles. Um, some of them were in collaboration with um, IBM Alden, which is you know, IBM's research uh, institution in, uh, on the peninsula. And uh, they have a large, they employ a large number of physicists to create technology that's not going to be out in two years, but 10 years. 
continuums out. And so talking about not creating a, a hard drive that's you know two or three gigs, but you know, suddenly you have a, uh, you know, a terabyte or you know, there are 500 terabytes. Um, or just increasing the technology by orders of magnitude rather than just aging along. And uh, I also had the opportunity to work at NASA for a while and um, because they do a lot of condensed matter there. And uh, that was a, a good experience. Um, and uh, one of the main focuses that I did was I worked with uh, surface plasmons. And those are super fun uh, because you're setting up charge density waves. Um, quantum charge density waves on nanoparticles where you're exciting these spherical harmonics on the nanoparticles and uh, the long-lived eigenstates and when you get them uh, near other things um, you know, quantum field theory comes into play where you're controlling the boundary conditions and the expectations of things that take place and uh, <coughs> I don't know, it's really nice fundamental physics to look at and that's always exciting so, and again, I was distilling there too. So I've been distilling for a long time. And, uh, and after that, I went and did a postdoc position. It was a collaboration between UC and AdVision Inc., which was a startup that was then bought out by a Japanese company. And uh, they did something that was really fun. Um, I went in this direction because I was, um, I was still interested in academia, but I also wanted to get a feeling for what it was like to be in the industry. And I thought this was a good sort of taste to work within a company, collaborating with UC, doing my own research, um, but also getting the feel for what it was like to be within the company. And uh, I brought with my with me my expertise in surface plasmons. And this company had a really interesting uh, idea where they did um, they literally printed out light bulbs on a transparency. So they printed out thin films of, uh, of semiconducting polymers on a transparency paper with uh, an indium tin oxide uh, electrode on one side, which is a transparent metal. And then you would plate the back side of it with like uh, silver or gold or aluminum, whatever work function you needed to be able to access the, uh, the, the The, the charge within the, the, the semiconductor layer. And that's really, it's neat because it's a reversible process. Not only can you create light with it, but you can also absorb light and create energy. So it's also a solar panel at the same time. And it's printable. And so one could easily imagine, well, what if we, instead of printing out um, the stuff on paper, what if we print it on something like a shingle? And then you just, Next time you, you replace the roof on your house, you replace it with these solar panel shingles that look just like shingles. And you've just covered your whole roof with solar panels. Uh, the other thing you could do is inside this room, instead of having all these point source lights, you could coat the whole ceiling in this stuff and have this really uh, diffuse ambient light that would be very energy efficient. Uh, and it would provide actually sort of more natural light in terms of the sky for the outside or light of this. So they were doing really, really cool stuff. And I did fun stuff there uh, working with using uh, surface plasmons to modify uh, the way that the, the fluorescent and phosphorescent characteristics work um, in those, those polymer layers. And uh, it, was, uh, it was fun work. One thing that I found that was interesting, though, was that while I was working there, there was, there was a bunch of scientists, and we're all working really hard. And then there were three people with offices. And the three people that had offices was the CEO, uh, the CTO, which was another physicist, the chief technical officer, and, and the patent lawyer, who also had a, a, a PhD in some science. And, and I thought to myself, and I, and I knew a friend that went on in the patent law, and I thought, well, you know, if I was to leave science and academia, what would I do? Do I want to go work in industry and do 
bunch of um, you know, continue doing research um, for a company where it's 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 exciting because you're you're carving a new path, um, but then there's some drawbacks too because you are you're inching stuff forward um, and you you're then driven by trying to create a better semiconductor device. Like maybe you're maybe you're using uh, skin and tendon microscopes to look inside of uh, or or TEM um, transmission electron microscopes to look inside of these wires that you're that people are using inside of the silicon wafers where they're literally just a few atoms wide and, and you're looking at the migration of gold atoms. Um, and the whole goal there isn't necessarily to know more science, but to make a better chip. And I thought to myself, well, the patent lawyers actually have a really interesting job because they're paying attention to the research papers that are published, they're looking at the technology that people are pushing out, they're also looking at what's been patented, um, and in that way, they work with all the scientists and drive and shape the direction that the scientists take in the company. And if you're working for a firm, ah, okay, I kind of skip that. So if you're working for a firm, then uh, it's uh, you're working with different scientists across different companies, and you're you're able to work with people's successes. And that sounds like a lot of fun because you're not beating your head against the wall with getting that solder to stick on that wire or, or, or whatever the frustrations or all of the, you know, we, we used to joke about having a, starting up a journal of just nothing but null results. Because so many times you're, you're doing research and you think this is going to work and then you find out that it doesn't behave that way and that you can't publish that. But it's interesting at the same time because your initial guess or hypothesis was that this behaves that way. And so, you know, it, I think it would be great to have a journal just by itself and just negative results. No, it doesn't work this way. No, no, you, you may think this, but it doesn't work that way. And as a patent lawyer, you would never deal with that. You'd, you'd work with scientists that said, hey, I found something and it worked. And I, I thought that sounded uh, so it, at that point in time while I was doing postdoc, I sort of reviewed what my skills were and what my, uh, what my opportunities were. So I kind of joked that I was a quantum mechanic because I was hands-on, I did stuff, and I mostly broke quantum mechanics. And as a physicist, you know, you're, you're huge with math. Uh, and I do, I work with STMs and TMs and AFMs and ultra-vacuum systems. Uh, different sort of photo uh, spectroscopy. I definitely learned a lot of computer science uh, because in order to control your experiments or do simulations or because I did a little bit of theory, it's just, you know, you you need computer science these days. Um, you need to learn a couple of languages. Um, I can't emphasize that enough. So, you know, Java and SQL and Python and R and uh, all that sort of stuff. And I was also the head TA at the physics department in Santa Cruz for uh, a couple of years, I think it was. And so I, I loved teaching. I taught the, the TAs um, how to teach, and I was taught at the same time. And I think that it's, uh, it's, it's a wonderful thing. And it's also really motivating because, you know, you, if you're passionate about something and you want to share it with other people, then those other people are depending on you to get that information across. And so it's, I, it's very motivating for me. Uh, and so I looked at what I could do, and I professorships. Um, I, I think that uh, you know, I, I sort of looked at my trajectory with how many papers I'd have to publish and where I could land a teaching position. And I didn't want to become a professor at, uh, say, like Princeton or, or Stanford or Berkeley or wherever, uh, because um, I felt like there's so much stress, stress, and there's so much elbowing, and there's so much politics that I felt like, oh, it's something where you could teach, but also have enough funding to do research would just be ideal. And then you look across the United States and you think about how many of those universities actually exist, and where are they, and what kind of quality of life would you have, and uh, and, and so I, I got, and you look at like I don't know, for every uh, 
professor out there that's graduating, that takes on graduate students, you know, maybe you have like two to a dozen grad students for every professor and they're graduating a couple every year and how often does a professor retire and so how long are you waiting to actually for a professorship to open up? And I might note that this was 2009, 2000, yeah, 2009, and that was right when uh, the economy crashed and UC Santa Cruz at least uh, basically uh, put a hold on all of their lecturers and started asking their faculty um, because of budget cuts and weren't really taking on more people and they said, wow, that's, I'm finishing up my postdoc and no one's hiring me. And so what are my options? Um, so there's research positions at uh, national labs like uh, NIST and NREL and uh, you know, Lawrence Berkeley and all these great places. Uh, and I could go into industry and do laboratory research and uh, data science or I could become a data scientist. Um, I got a few buddies that one works at Apple and one works at Google and a few work at a few startups and another buddy of mine started his own startup um, which is actually an interesting idea. He's created a, a, a site where you can publish articles through his site using uh, LaTeX or, uh, or Word. I think he's, he's allowed people to submit papers on it. But he does like all the graphics, like you, you submit your data and it'll show up nicely, your equations show up nicely. And, and he's also, it's private, but you can also share your data. So if you have a lot of collaborators, it's really easy to share your data with everybody. So he actually has um, people at CERN use his, uh, his company's website a lot. Um, but uh, then there's legal, like I said, patent law, and then there's also consulting. Um, which I didn't look very far into, but it's always a possibility. Um, and so I actually studied for the patent bar exam and sat there and took it and passed it. So I'm a registered patent people. And I actually did prosecute a few uh, patents for people. And uh, it was, uh, I didn't get far enough into it to really be able to give you a good feel for what it would be like to work for a company or work for uh, doing it because while I was while I was looking for jobs at the, at the end of that uh, uh, postdoc um, I end up getting a, a call from Wall Street so and when I say a call what I meant was I was what I mean is I was talking to a buddy of mine um, about a surf trip that we're going to take um, to Indonesia and and I was talking about my postdoc ending and this and that. And this is an old buddy of mine that did physics at Berkeley and then he went to the Hospital of Business for an MFE, a Master's in Financial Engineering. And then he went to, to Wall Street after that. And, and he said, oh, I know of, um, you know, there's positions here, send me your resume and I'll send them off to people and maybe you'll get a job. And I said, well, that couldn't hurt. Uh, and, and it hurt a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I mean, it, when I was a graduate student, you know, I, I've always, you know, I, I've loved physics, but I've also done other stuff. So I took, like, you know, a bunch of Spanish courses, and I took some more oceanography courses, graduate level, when I was a grad student, and I sat in on some, um, like, econometrics courses, and uh, just to get an overall feel for other stuff that I missed out on, and, and just to be able to learn stuff about other fields. And, uh, and it, it came in handy because then I had to sit down and study my butt off for a bunch of interviews coming up with a bunch of bankers. And, uh, and it reminds me a little bit of Paul Graham, if anybody knows who that is. But he's a, he's a startup incubator guy in Silicon Valley. That online, he's, he, he's published a bunch of essays that are, are, are really nice, and I recommend um, and uh, and one of his, his things that he talks about is that you know you never know what's going to prepare you for the future, and so you should just always be absorbing whatever you can along the way. And and I definitely hold to that. Um, you know, taking and I'm sure you've heard where you know if you find out some professor, you know they're 
you know, for that quantum course, they're way easy. And so you kind of hold off and you try to take that quantum course. Then, you know, you're kind of cheating yourself because then if you didn't push yourself with that harder professor, then, you know, you didn't learn as much. And, um, and you don't know what you're going to miss out on in the future when you're going to have to relearn something or learn it for the first time. And people are kind of expecting you to know what it is that uh, you don't know. So, uh, you know, so taking econometrics courses and whatnot at, for fun ended up really helping me out with, uh, with job interviews. And uh, it's one of those things where I talked to, uh, you know, they called me up once a day for like a week and um, for like an hour, hour and a half long job interview where they basically just threw questions at me to figure out if I could figure out how to handle that sort of problem. And I'm not talking about like brain teasers. Like they would really, they would just want to figure out what my approach to a certain problem is. So they would try to make stuff up like, say you're watching a stock and it's, you think that it's, it's, it might increase in value, but you know, you need to figure out over what time scales um, and, uh, I don't know, I'm not, not very good at doing interview questions on the So, <clears throat> uh, so it, it, it's, and I think that was the other thing that impressed me <clears throat> during those interviews. Is that I was expecting to get on the phone with a bunch of bankers, and I put them in a box, and I was thinking, okay, this is going to be weird, and there's going to be a bunch of bankers. But everyone that I spoke to on the phone, which ended up being everybody in the group that I worked in, were all PhDs. Uh, there was a computer science PhD, there was a math PhD, there was an uh, economics PhD, a physics PhD, and so the bank basically hired a bunch of people to think about things and try to move things forward. And the way the bank was structured is that they called individual groups inside of the bank different businesses, and literally you could apply it to academia where it's like a research group. You know, it's a group of like five or six people, and you're all working towards a common goal, um, trying to produce some research, or in some cases, make money. Uh, and as a quant, when you produce research, what it means is that you're maybe you're looking at risk. You know, if you are uh, buying something, um, you want to know what kind of risk you're holding. Is it market risk? Like, is, at some point in time, everyone going to think? You know, that object that you just bought, it's not that valuable. And the value on it is declining. Or are you holding some sort of foreign exchange risk where that thing's tied to some other currency and um, and that means you need to understand like what how volatile is that currency in relationship to your own. Uh, and so basically they're trying to solve like big correlation matrices uh, to figure out what kind of risk people are holding. And uh, and the group that I was in, I landed in a great group, um, and the guy that I worked for was um, a great guy, and uh, it was a lot of fun, the problems that we solved. Um, and I ended up doing trading um, on uh, the credit trading floor at Barclays. And, and it, literally, it looks like this. I was one of these guys with four monitors in front of them. And there's, on that floor, there's probably 700, 800, 900 people, something like that. And, and it just goes up in the building like that for a few floors, because there's, uh, there's FX, and there's equities, and there's credit. And everybody has just a bunch of traders there. And you know, it's, uh, everything I ever learned from trading came from movie trading places. So um, I was well seen. And it, it's, uh, and, and, and it does happen where, you know, at 9 a.m. or when new numbers come out, the place gets into a big uproar and people are excited and yelling things at each other and whatnot. Even though, you know, it's all done over the computer now. Like if you look, like on the news and you see uh, the New York Stock Exchange floor, and you'll see a couple guys milling about, and that's because that's, that's the action that's happening there. It's just nothing taking place there. People aren't trading with, with a piece of paper anymore. It's all electronic. Granted, in credit, it's kind of exciting because while it is electronic, it's 
it's on the level of someone sending somebody else an email and saying, I'd like to buy this. And then they say, okay, the price is this. And uh, whereas in say like equities, that's where the market volatility comes from that we all are very aware of when we have market captures because there's high frequency trading taking place where computers are trying to put in trades as quickly as possible to take or offer liquidity in the market. And when some bump happens, um, you know, the companies try to be risk adverse and they want to pull their algos from the market, but the algos are usually offering a lot of liquidity in the market. And so as soon as you pull that, people don't know where the prices are anymore, and then the market starts going to pay And so it's hard because, you know, it, we all like going on to Google Finance or Yahoo Finance and seeing the price of Google today. Um, and that's, you know, that's electronic. And, uh, and it's, I don't know, uh, uh, it, it's, it's, I don't, I don't know what point it is. It, <coughs> trading electronically is, it's funny because it's, uh, in some circles, you know, people think that it's really scary, um, that computers are sort of taking over the markets. Um, but at the same time, it's it's a natural progression. Um, so, in credit market, um, what we were doing was sort of exciting because we weren't trying to predict the future with our algos. We were trying to predict the credit because in credit, it's a liquid market, and uh, it's sort of like trying to figure out how much of the price of that house is. You know, you might know within fifty thousand dollars or hundred thousand dollars in this market, uh, but you know, if you, if you had an algo trying to draw correlations between uh, comparable houses in the area and what the whole market is doing in general and maybe some details on your house and how that's affected with the other houses, uh, you might be able to narrow your estimate down on your house to a lower error bars. And that's exactly what we were doing on the market, is we were just trying to figure out where these bonds should be traded at. Because these bonds that we were looking at you know, if, if one of the traders or, or if our algo, algo bought one, then he would hold on to it for a month, two months, something like that. And if you're holding on to it for that long, you want to make sure that you got a good price and that, and we weren't buying, we were, we were a pawn shop. We were saying, if you want to buy or sell, you know, you can come to us and these are our prices. And if we we're offering prices on the market, you better be pretty sure we know where the market's at. And when you're trying to buy or sell a house, you know, houses and stuff, then you know, maybe you're within 50K, because so you're only looking for really good deals to make sure that uh, you can sell it. But on the, the, uh, on the stock exchange, or the, or the bond market, you can't get really good deals, because that's illegal. You can screen people over. And so uh, you just have to know, you have to know with good certainty where the market's at. Yeah. Michael, so this is, this is in a sense, the team at Barclays you were working at was an aggregator kind of pulling together many small people were making loans and so on and you were trying to find out if the terms on the loans were were equitable and therefore if they were equitable whether you take them in as a, as a group or, or, um, well, or were you doing it more in-house like for your own thing and, and, and providing was, credit? It was more in-house so Barclays is a dealer uh, and so what that means is that it's, it deals in whatever assets that uh, it's <coughs> trying to buy or sell. And that means that it's offering liquidity to the market, which means it's offering prices to the market. And there's some people like uh, mutual funds or uh, uh, like retirement, like people managing retirement um, funds for like the university. They need to make sure that their portfolios are balanced. And when at the end of the year they're trying to rebalance their portfolios, they might come to us and say, well, we have, you know, the stock market's done really well and the bond market's dropped a little bit, so we need to sell a bunch of stocks and buy some bonds to make sure our portfolio's balanced. And they would come to Barclays and say, we need to buy a bunch of bonds. And we'd say, sure, we have bonds and this is our price. And if you need to sell any particular other bonds, then we'll, we're willing to buy them and this is our price on those. Um, and in that way, 
inside the bank that was a business because we don't offer the same price for buying and selling. We buy buy low and sell high. Trading places. <laughs> um, so it's uh, so it, we were. It, it is a money making venture within the bank, um, and it's sort of a you know. And there's only so many banks out there that can do something like that because you need to be big enough. And that's kind of the crux of the whole too big to fail thing is that you need these big institutions to go really do some stuff. But how much risk and how much governance and all that stuff, there's, there's so many details and it's a very complex problem. Um, so that's what we did. And, you know, it's the hours were terrible. I wouldn't recommend it for everybody. Uh, I worked 80 hours a week. Um, I had to be on the training floor before 7 because that's when training started. And trading ended at uh, it was like 4:35 o'clock, and and then after that, you still need to get work done, and so you're there until like uh, 9, 10 o'clock at night, um, sometimes 11, sometimes later, and if you stayed late enough, then the bank would, you know, give you you, you could get dinner from any restaurant in Manhattan, and they would give you a limo home, and that was like their little bonus for working really late. And then the, the sad part was is that there's investment bankers at the bank who worked so hard that it wasn't like a nine o'clock nine o'clock cutoff that they would give you a car home. It was like a ten or eleven o'clock cutoff. And so uh, you know those guys had to work because they knew they weren't going to be going home at nine o'clock. That it's gonna be like ten, eleven one o'clock in the morning, they're going home. So investment bankers work their butts off. Um, I don't envy them at all. Um, and they burn out um, pretty hard. When, when I went there, they uh, it was part of their new hires, and because they, they hire seasonally, so you have to make sure that you're in the right cycle, and I just happen to be. And for the quants and the associates that I sort of went in with, um, you know, we had these, this whole MBA program that they put us through for uh, almost a year um, that I was the beneficiary of. And they uh, also had the investment makers. And you could see that there was like one short bus that they would load up the quants and people on to take us like, to whatever event we were going to. And then the new investment makers that they took on, I think there was like five full, like, Greyhound size buses that they took on because they just they bring them in by the boatload and because they know they're going to drop like flies um, because they just really just want to do that. And um, it's, I think that, you know, people that do well at it, you know, they stick with it for a while and, and they get through that part, maybe it gets better, but it's hard. I mean, I looked at my boss and my boss's boss, and it, nowhere up the line was, um, did it ever get easy. Um, are just working their butts off. And they call it the golden handcuffs because the cash was very good. Uh, but you're working so hard that when I realized that I had a son while I was there and four months later I quit my job. And um, it's funny because you kind of think, you know, you want to create stability in life and a good job and income and all this. And then, oh, okay, then we can have a kid. Well, we did that and then I was like, we got to get out of here. Okay? quit my job because where I was like oh man I realized that I wouldn't know my son because I'd go before I'd leave in the morning before he woke up and I'd get home after he went to bed and then on the weekends I was trashed um, and scared of Monday so um, you know it, I think that if I'd gone to it like my buddy did right after undergrad and after a one year program not doing a six year PhD I would have have a little more energy and a little bit more like I can take this thing down to sort of attitude. And maybe I would have stuck in it longer like my buddy did. Um, but by the time I got there, I, uh, I, I enjoyed it. I liked the problems. Um, it's sort of like, I don't know when your problem sets are due, but when I was an undergrad, we rarely slept on Thursday nights, just busting out problem sets. And it felt like that every day. Um, and that's both good and bad. Because it's interesting problems, but it's also um, hard. Okay. So uh, on the subway in the mornings, I wrote a business plan. 
Um, and uh, and I worked with uh, people uh, out here to get an SBA loan to match my own cash to be able to open up the distillery. And the distiller was an idea that my wife and I had back when I was a postdoc. And we thought, okay, we want to we want to open up the distillery, and we'll do it at some point in time. And maybe it's sooner, maybe it's later. Um, but we have this great opportunity in New York, and this would be a good way to get cash. And so let's let's do this. And then the end game is open up the distillery, and that came quicker because um, of the the conditions. So uh, over the last two years, I built out the distillery uh, with some help, and you know I did all my own CAD drawings, did my own engineering, did you know the city made me hire some engineers so that they could stamp on it, uh, and that worked out just great. And uh, then we got into full production this summer, where uh, you know we got our still in. Uh, in place, I think in June, and so we've been running all summer distilling. And then, uh, just as of last month, we got into uh, markets. We got signed up for the distributor, and now we're in play. <laughs> Super exciting, um, and it's great because it's kind of like giving a talk in academia when you're doing a bunch of research and you're just in it, and then you go out to a conference, and then you kind of remember what you're doing in the bigger picture and. And people get excited, and you get excited when they get excited. And, and then now that we're out in the market, people are um, are drinking our, our can and excited, and we get excited. So, so I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, what goes on inside there. I don't know how much time I have left, but I'll try to be quick about it. About 12 minutes, oh, okay. 13 minutes. Cool. So uh, I'm not a chemist, and this is a bunch of chemistry. But this is basically what takes place within uh, uh, the uh, metabolic process from the yeast. Um, they basically take a bunch of sugar and they spit out ethanol and carbon dioxide. And uh, there's a bunch of enzymes inside the yeast and their puzzle pieces and breaking apart molecules and reconfiguring them and that sort of stuff. And i um, not going to do algebra for you today. Uh, and uh, one thing that's kind of interesting here is that uh, there's a bunch of papers that you can find on uh, on fermentation and distilling and um, that sort of stuff that's done by like Davis. Um, they have a bunch of researchers there that are doing fun stuff on this. Um, and I didn't cite my sources on all this stuff, so I feel <laughs> terrible. I'm claiming all of this work. As you know. <laughs> uh, so uh, in this figure that you can't read. Uh, there's uh, sucrose levels that diminish over time. We have time here and we have a concentration. And so as you're fermenting, basically what happens is you take starches uh, in the form of grain usually and you, uh, you heat them up to a certain temperature where some of the, some of the enzymes that are inside of the starches, the, the malted grains, um, become active. And there's alpha and beta elements. Um, and depending on what temperature that you're at, some of those uh, enzymes are, are more dominant than the other. And they'll break apart those long um, chains in different ways, where some of them sort of break them apart from the middle, and some of them work from the ends and go down and break them apart into simple sugars. And depending on which, uh, which enzyme you, you, you allow to dominate, you're going to end up changing the mouthfeel of your spirit. Um, in after distillation. You'll end up getting something that's a little bit rounder and softer or something that's a little bit hotter and a little more alcohol, alcoholic sort of tasting. And uh, after you, you, you heat it up and you let it break down into the simple sugars, uh, you pitch yeast into it after cooling it down um, back to a, a reasonable temperature. And when the yeast goes to work on all the sugars inside of there, uh, the sugars, it consumes the sugars, so the sugars deplete. And uh, you end up getting alcohol increasing and also some biomass, which is some other sort of off products that the yeast is putting out because they're not just putting out carbon dioxide and ethanol, but they're putting out each other stuff too. And it, some people did some experiments where they looked at different concentrations of sugar and how much alcohol you produce from it. And you find that you don't just get more alcohol and more sugar you put in because. Um, at some point in time, you're saturating the, the yeast's ability to um, convert alcohol or sugar into alcohol. 
And that's because of stress. You're stressing out the yeast. Um, and when you stress out yeast, uh, you end up creating stuff other than people. One, you can kill the yeast. And then two, uh, you create other stuff other than alcohol and the flavors that you want. There's multiple metabolic pathways. The pyruvate here is the, the enzyme inside the yeast. It's sort of the dominant one that's creating our ethanol down here. But you can, it can, it can turn out aldehydes. It can turn out, um, you know, like formaldehyde, ethyl aldehyde, uh, methyl aldehyde, uh, acetyls, fatty acids, lipids, esters. Um, some of the stuff uh, you want, and some of it you don't. Um, and the stuff that you do want, you only want it in the right concentrations. Because when you have like a half a bite of beer, and you get that nice like uh, fruity banana flavor coming through, that's because of the esters, and um, that's a byproduct of yeast. And so, when you are making whiskey, you can get like a really fruity sort of whiskey coming through just by fermenting fermenting at the right temperatures or with the right uh, sugar concentrations to be able to uh, favor sort of an ester production. And you also tune that by choosing a specific strain of yeast that, that creates more esters. So because there's multiple pathways, uh, you have to be a little careful about what kind of stress you're causing on the yeast. And so the yeast are excre excreting ethanol, and that's actually bad for the yeast. Um, so they're swimming around in a product that they made that's killing them. Um, heat, if it gets too high in temperature, uh, yeast consumption of sugar is an excellent process. And so they're, again, they're hurting themselves. And we have to stop them from hurting themselves. <coughs> uh, weak acids, osmotic, like if there's not enough water in there. Um, uh, too, if it's too cold, if you don't have nutrients, um, sulfites and oxidative. And then, uh, what was this figure? This figure was, I think it was uh, the amount of ethanol production given an increase in, in ethanol. So if you have very little ethanol uh, inside of your, your initial mixture, your initial solution, then you can create a lot of ethanol. But if you have very, a whole lot of ethanol that's already in there, then you're not going to be able to create a whole lot of that because you're pouring yeast into an inhospitable hospital environment and they just croak. Uh, and this is just sort of a, to give you an idea of uh, what kind of uh, other molecules that the yeast will put out in their production. And this is just the top 5% of the other uh, uh, contributors that yeast put in there. Um, so, you know, and, and there's, some of this is good and some of it's bad. Like, I'm seeing Tolly being here, that's terrible. Um, benzene's worse. What, what's that? Benzene's worse. Yeah, benzene's worse, yeah. But ethyl alcohol right there, we love that. Uh, but yeah, so I mean, it's terrible stuff. And so, you know, when you drink wine, and when you drink beer, you're drinking it. It's terrible. Good. That's why you distill. <laughs> See, what we do is we take beer and wine and we make it better <laughs> by by removing a lot of this terrible stuff. So, but if you learn anything today, <laughs> you should listen to me. Uh, so when we distill, um, it's a really sort of simple process with equipment that's been around since Alexandria. I think it's the first time that uh, there's a written record of, uh, of uh, uh, someone getting this done. And it was, yeah, anyway. Uh, so, you know, we have evaporation temperatures for all of these different uh, main components that we might put inside the still. And I guess I should back up and say, so in the distillery, we make beer, and then we pour that beer into the still, and then we heat it up, and then we evaporate off the alcohol. And we catch the alcohol as it comes off, and that's what we're doing in a very simple sort of way. Uh, however, uh, as I just said, there's a bunch of different stuff in there, and all of these are um, they're all volatile uh, compounds, and they all evaporate at a different temperature, which means that if we were to uh, close our system and maybe heat it at the bottom and cool it at the top, 
we might set up a, a gradient of volatile compounds within the column of the scale. And then if we crack the top and adiabatically pull off each individual molecule, then we would be able to, to sort them in little boxes. And that's sort of what we do at the, at the distillery, except uh, we run a lot faster because uh, that would take forever. And, um, and the other thing is that you want it to, you, you want some of them, you don't want others. And theoretically, we could sort them in little boxes and then you know, mix them and create the perfect cocktail. But uh, it's, it's way easier to just run it a little bit faster, but not too fast, um, and apply the right amount of cooling, the right amount of heating, uh, in order to create the perfect blend um, for, for my palate, at least. So when we distill, um, hey. <laughs> No, you certainly didn't. My apologies. So when we distill, uh, there's sort of a, a, a cool phenomenon that takes place where inside the still here, uh, we put all of our, our wash. And this is a 250-pound still um, made in Kentucky. And uh, so it, it can produce anything with flavor, really. Um, we don't do out, we don't do vodka because we would need another type of still to be able to separate out so cleanly that it would be really almost pure ethanol, um, except for the the azeotrope coming out. But it's and that's what vodka is. Vodka is you take your beer, or your wine, or whatever, and you strip out every bit of flavor that you can, and that's that's vodka. Uh, and unless it's bad vodka. <laughs> and then there's some of this other stuff in there, and you're going to get a hangover. Um, so, uh, but the way that we do it in our still is uh, we have plates inside this column where the vapor that's coming up after we, we heat the, the wash, the alcohol and the other stuff is coming up in these plates. <coughs> and these plates are designed so that the vapor, when it condenses on the walls and stuff, can collect on those plates. And then the new vapor that's coming up has to bubble up through that that layer of liquid, and in that way, new vapor can mix with that old vapor, and maybe only the most volatile compounds from that mixture will make it up to the next plate, and then the next plate, the most volatile compounds make it up to the next plate. And the way that we really describe that is is with this curve here, where this is the percent alcohol uh, in the liquid on each one of those plates. And this is the percent alcohol in the vapor that's coming up. And it's interesting because you know if we draw just a y equals x curve here, and then we also look at the curve for the alcohol water vapor equilibrium, where you know if you have a contained box with ethanol and water in there, and you looked at how much with it what the alcohol concentration was in the water versus what was in the air then what you find is it's not equal. Uh, you actually find that uh, there's more alcohol in the vapor than there is inside the liquid. And if you think about it for a second, it might make sense just that if you have you know, a water molecule and an alcohol molecule that's, that's jostling down and bouncing against the water, there's a higher probability, or the, the liquid I should say, there's a higher probability that the water's gonna stick and the alcohol's gonna bounce off because it's more volatile. And so, you know, there's sort of a one-way direction on that where everything's equal, and then finally you reach this equilibrium where there's more alcohol in there. So, uh, so for each one of these plates, you get this concentrate, concentration of liquid uh, at each plate, and then the air above it has higher alcohol concentration, which means that the liquid on the plate above it is going to have higher, and so on and so forth. So, uh, and then there's the aging process, uh, where uh, the, there's two different things that we do in aging. One is we oxygenate the, uh, uh, the, the solution that's in there. When I say solution, I mean whiskey. Uh, and that's creating uh, um, ethyl aldehyde. And, uh, and uh, we're also extracting compounds from the oak, which 
chart in itself. And this is just some of the, the compounds that we extract from the oak. The most dominant here that you might recognize is vanillin. So that's why if you taste for a really well aged whiskey, you're going to get these vanilla, caramel, custard kind of notes coming through. Um, and, uh, and it tastes great. So inside the distillery, we do a lot of science. Um, in the startup build out phase, there is just a ton of design to do. And I don't know how people do this without having a good background science. Because, I mean, just everything required me to draw some, something out and do a calculation. And, I mean, there's, you know, hydrostatic pressures and there's, there's I do my own circuits and, you know, and that's one thing is that it's kind of fun is that, uh, so I have a baby still that's only five gallons and I have this 250 gallon still. And both of them are running off Arduino. Uh, it's, I, I don't know why everybody doesn't do this. Um, I have uh, incredible control. I think I wrote it down somewhere. Yeah. So, you know, the resolution that I have on temperatures and using RTDs all over the still and you know, I'm getting 0 0.03 degrees of temperature resolution, and with flow meters and barometers and the temperature sensors and the little robotics that I did with gearing on steam valves, and, and then the steam design itself required a lot of calculations and stuff. Um, so it's, I, I mean, I guess people don't do it because, you know, you have to be able to do a little bit of everything, right? So everything in the distillery is running on a combination of Java and Python, and it's, everything's backed up to my SQL database, and it's a distributed system, uh, which is a headache in itself, but it allows me so much more control and so much more consistency that uh, I just, I wouldn't be able to make the gin that I'm making today if I didn't have that control. Um, and when I taste some other people's gin, um, one, I, I wonder about their palate, and two, I, I think, uh, it's got to be hard. It's really hard to do that. Uh, one buddy of mine that does a great job with some whiskeys, um, the way that he runs his still is when he wants to know what's going on with it, he walks to the other side of the distillery, like 20 yards away, and he picks up a pair of binoculars. And he looks up at the top of the still, the very, very top, uh, where there's a, a, a dial gauge, a temperature gauge at the top. And that's how he takes his measurement. And he's like, yeah, it's... Plus or minus a few degrees, right there. And it, it blows me away because um, while I'm doing this, you know, a, a change in one degree uh, could change, I think it's 10% alcohol in time still. So you need a really fine measurement on, on your temperatures um, in, order, in order to know what's happening. And the way that I do that is one with really good uh, temperature sensors, and then the other is using common filters, and common filters are, are awesome. Um, I I never personally used them until I worked on Wall Street, um, and um, since then I, I think they're awesome. I've used particle filters and uh, like sort of a little bit of machine learning, um, but common filters are pretty simple. They're uh, recursive, and they're real time, they're really fast to calculate, and basically what you're doing is you're taking a bunch of data that has Gaussian or non-Gaussian noise inside of it, and you're trying to clean it up to get a better estimate on, on where your uh, your signal's at. And it's uh, you know it's it's typically I've I've only ever seen it used in time series data. It's used a lot in robotics and with rockets. Um, and it it's uh, it's uh, it's the curve here that we see is like the green. Uh, data points here are uh, just sort of random noise that's decreasing in time. And the blue curve here is uh, a three sigma boundary on these on the green points. And the black curve here is representing the error on the, the common filter. And the red curve here is representing the three sigma off the common. And so you can see here that just using a common filter we're reducing the three sigma from like about five x, uh, and so people use them all the time um, uh, in space, and I think it's it's a valuable thing to, to think of. That machine learning. So 
this is actually some data from the distillery. Uh, this is from uh, my control uh, software. And it's kind of fun. Uh, while I'm heating, this orange curve here is the temperature inside the pot. And these brighter orange curves here are the temperatures <laughs> of the column. And you can see the, the pot getting warmer and warmer over time until suddenly uh, you see a big spike. And then just a short while later, you see a big spike at the top of the column. And that's because if you've ever watched a pot boil, uh, it, it happens all of a sudden. Like, you know, you're watching the pot boil, and then suddenly, um, you know, there's basically no steam coming off. And then all of a sudden, you're getting all this water coming off because you, you reach the evaporation temperature. And that's what's happening right here. Is, that's what you're seeing. And suddenly, we're evaporating off a lot of ethanol and methanol and a bunch of other stuff. And then here is a, a typical curve for a run that I do where we were making gin on this day. And, uh, and you can see the temperature of the, of the, of the whole run uh, changing. It's, it's nonlinear. Um, and that's because this is sort of a zoom in on one section. Um, it's, 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 uh, it, there's a feedback loop taking place. Um, and some of it you can program, and some of it you just have to taste, literally. And uh, I was talking to Tony McGee, the owner of Logitech, one day, and he said that, that making beer is magic. You, know, you put a bunch of stuff in the, in the bucket and you seal it up. And, and you come back a month later and you have beer. And if you go one step up, you know, you try to keep the same temperature. Um, but in, in distilling, you, uh, it's alchemy, is what you said. Which I sit back and I was like, no, it's, no alchemy is turning uh, lead into gold, right? That's not, what it that's not what we're doing. But he meant science, because you're, you're measuring and you need a really good understanding of what's going on. You're tweaking, you're tuning. And you're adjusting the whole time that you're doing that. Um, it's not a process that you can just set and walk away from. And so it's fun because it's, you're able to, it's sort of like a really great experiment where at the end you get a drink here. <laughs> uh, so now there's, there's common filters and uh, distributed systems in, in this film. Um, I don't know if anybody else is doing it. I'm sure there's, some other people that are doing it in the closets like, like me, but, uh, but that's what we're doing. So I think that the main benefits that I'm getting right now from all the science that I'm doing in uh, the lab or in the, in the, the distillery is, uh, is it's really helping me control quality and it's also increasing the quality of the product a lot. Um, we're getting awesome reviews right now um, and we're getting picked up by a lot of awesome places. So it's super exciting. Uh, there's also a bunch of other science that I still want to do. Like, there's other like, you know, there's always better models to, to use. Um, there's also, you know, when you're distilling, it's interesting because you have options where if you keep your temperatures really low, then you're pulling off the more volatile compounds, and if you sweep your temperatures faster, then you, you move through those and you still pick them up, but you start picking up other ones. And then, so I'd almost like to do like a model of like a Fermi direct solution or a, a distribution where I'm trying to model how quickly and what quantity I'm going to be picking up the, um, the different compounds, depending on how quickly I, I sweep through temperature images. Um, and, you know, it's... Uh, there's always more automation to be done, and one of these days I really want to buy a mass spectrometer. So if anybody wants to buy a mass spec, because I mean it would be you can do mass spec on barrel aging, you can do mass spec on the final product, you can do mass spec on the ingredients that you're getting in, because the ingredient like supply chain implements are terrible. Because you'd think that businesses would just run well, but they don't. And that's why business school exists, because you need to figure out how to create a business that runs well. And most of them don't. So you know, it's and, and and they're biological products. You know, they're seasonal, just like grapes. You know, every year you have a good harvest and a bad harvest. And as a distiller, we need to buffer those those swings um, and do the best job we can at that. And mass spec, I bet would be awesome. 
So, uh, yeah, and that's the end of the talk. Um, you know, the results of all this is just uh, easy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Griffo. Um, he's happy to entertain questions, but I do want to let those of you who need to leave um, exit. Remember, there's this signature sheet. I'll set it outside. Anyone who, are, who need a signature, can you raise your hand? Does anyone here need a signature? Okay, I'll step outside for a couple of minutes, and we'll do a few questions from the rest of it. So in about 45 seconds, we're going to have questions in here, and I'll step outside. Is it illegal to bring alcohol onto the uh, Only if it's open. <laughs> <laughs> we have a campus club. Okay, I'm going to ask um, oh, yeah. that there are friendly. questions now. If we're going to step outside quietly, I'll take the questions. Yep. Yeah. yeah. From a health standpoint, trying to get pure alcohol without using You mean to making it yourself? No, 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 just in general. Uh, whiskey or buying, 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 top, buying top shelf, yeah. almost anything is probably going to be the best way to go. But, I mean, vodka's really, it should just be ethanol and water, and that's it. Right, nice, clean. Yeah, it's super clean. Um, but I mean, gin is made with basically it's it's almost just a flavored vodka, and so um, it's it's super clean. You're not going to get any of that stuff in there. The only sort of carcinogens and stuff that you might get in there are from the berries and the botanicals and stuff that we put in it. But then it's it's less carcinogenic than say making a glass of tea. So, so it's super healthy. It's super healthy. Yeah. Vitalizing. <laughs> Aqua vitae. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, uh, what is what goes into gin? Current berries or uh, so gin predominantly, as dictated it's by the, the TTB, is juniper berries. Mm -hmm. And here I actually sure. show the ingredients that we uh, we use. And so everyone's recipe is different, and always like a trade secret. And um, we use juniper berries, we use fresh local Meyer lemons, like literally my neighbor's tree. Uh, this is uh, tailed pepper and uh, coriander. Uh, coriander, Coriander, yeah. It, yeah, it's secret. In, in yeah, that's right. And then uh, grains of paradise, cinnamon, licorice root, and uh, gel pepper. And what was the one on the bottom right? That is uh, grains of paradise. It's a, it's a hard kind of seed. It's uh, it's kind of floral, a little spicy, a little citrus, uh, and it's uh, I don't like a, a very floral gin, but you need like good it's balance. Spice. Yeah. You need you need the right balance, and so like angelica root is is bitter, um, it has this kind of fresh bitterness to it, and you don't want a bitter drink, but you need to create this right you need the right balance. Yeah, yeah. So I would say that the gin that I make is actually it's sort of very technical um, in that I'm really trying to create a really nice, fresh, balanced gin. And balance is a, a hard thing to do. Most distillers out there try to create a gin that will have a signature for them where they go heavy on, say, like cucumber, or they go heavy on citrus, or they go heavy on something. And what you end up finding is that like some things are easier to drink than others. Like cucumber, it's nice and like sort of fresh and watery, and easier to drink. But the background, the balance in the background back there, it's it's uh, it's not balanced in the background, or even you know including the cucumber and taking it out, like it's kind of uh, you end up finding like maybe a little bit of like, bitter notes or or some astringentness back there. Um, and it's because you don't have to be as careful if you're pushing forward on the mechanical thing. It's really hard. At least that's my opinion. And so this is a critical component of a martini. It's the 
flavor in the marquee. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's it's funny because uh, you know I think back in the day, like when I used to drink gin in college, it was you know you, gin with you know just a little bit of vermouth um, and a twist or or all or something like that and. And nowadays, you know, you can find some great gins out there, and people are foregoing putting anything else in there. It's just slightly chilled gin with a twist or with a couple of olives, and there's no vermouth. Um, I find that vermouth actually, now especially with our gin, it, it kind of it throws the, um, the, the, the palate out of my mind. But, I mean, each their own. And there's that called the man. Yeah. No, that's just a martini. If, if, if there's no vermouth in it, it's, it's bone dry. And then you get an extra dry where you just get a little bit of vermouth inside the shaker and pour it out and then put it in there. Um, so, you know, you can make a martini in a few different ways. So we have um, another class, a, a geology class that comes in here after this. I'd say we have time, maybe one student question, but then we can step outside and continue questions out in the lobby. And those of you who wanted to join us for dinner, please talk to me. I need to get a really accurate head count and, and talk to you. Um, so why don't we take one question here, but let's then gather up and have more of a conversation out in the lobby. Uh, I hope it's kind of a good question then. So you were talking a lot about, obviously, so gin, you're not aging it in a barrel or anything like that currently, so you're able to release it immediately. Yeah. You talked a lot about uh, whiskey, uh, just like and such like that. Uh, what would be like a really cool like dream for you as far as like, what kind of whiskey are you going for? Like uh, 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 one that was ex sherry cask or ex bourbon cask? Are you going for like a uh, uh, ten year or two year? You know, what what would be something really cool that you think you'd want to do with that? So we're doing three different whiskeys right now. One is uh, just a standard bourbon, and then another one is uh, rye, and then we're also doing what we're calling right now, for lack of a better name, an American whiskey. But we're using a blend of French and American oak staves. Um, new oak or used? Uh, new staves. Nice. Um, and that's, uh, we're, we're partnering with the Cooperage to do that. And, um, and it's, uh, you know, it, it's funny because it's all oak, but they all add their different compounds. And um, getting a, a, a perfect blend between them is, I think, really exciting. I've also, I've, I have enjoyed other whiskeys too that have like, um, you know, have been finished in cherry casks and, and that sort of stuff. And I think that at some point in time, because we are in wine country, that we're going to have to do that because it tastes great and, and we have great access to barrels. Uh, but that's down to it. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Let's, let's thank Dr. Griffo again. Yeah.